Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and today's edition of the Most Detailed Archive. A more focused series looking into aspects and components of Halo lore that come up often across the highways and byways of my videos, particularly the Most Detailed Breakdown series. Today we're doing the whole nine yards on repulsor engines that are commonplace across the Covenant and Banished fleets as well as new top of the line UNSC warships and a plethora of ground and aerial vehicles. This one's going to be a little sciencey, but I have faith in you and it shouldn't be a problem for people of our calibre. So let's get nerdy. Repulsor engines use stacked tidal gravity generators which create asymmetrical gravity fields that push and pull a ship through space in a desired vector, all without the need for reaction mass or conventional exhaust. This means that the actual engines generate extremely powerful artificial gravity fields or gravitic tidal forces that the ship is effectively pulled towards, falls into or is pushed along by. But how exactly would the repulsor engines generate these tidal gravitic forces? Well, in order to answer that, we need to do a little bit of a dive into quantum mechanics. So, let's discuss the fundamental forces. In physics, the fundamental interactions, also known as the fundamental forces, are the interactions that do not appear to be reducible to a more basic interaction. There are four fundamental forces known to exist. There's a hypothetical fifth, but we're going to stick with the four for now. The gravitational and electromagnetic interactions which produce significant long-range forces whose effects can be seen directly in everyday life, and the strong and weak interactions which produce forces at minuscule subatomic distances and govern nuclear interactions. It just so happens that three of these fundamental forces have particles associated with them. In the standard model, the electromagnetic, strong nuclear and weak nuclear forces associate with elementary particles whose behaviours are modelled in quantum mechanics. Force particles, called gauge bosons, force carriers or messenger particles of underlying fields, interact with particles of matter. This basically means that the fundamental forces have a quantum particle that carries their force. The force carriers of the strong nuclear force is called a gluon and is responsible for the strong bonding between quarks, a quantum particle of a hadron which themselves form the core of atoms. The force carriers of the weak nuclear force is the W and Z bosons and are known for their role in the mediation of nuclear decay. The force carrier of the electromagnetic force is the photon, that is a quantum of the electromagnetic field including electromagnetic radiation such as light and radio waves and the force carrier for the electromagnetic force. Photons are massless so they always move at the speed of light in a vacuum. Gravitation however, at least currently, hasn't had its elementary particle discovered. This is likely because while gravity acts at astronomical scales and keeps planets orbiting stars and stars orbiting galaxies and so on, the force itself is actually very weak. This is why we are able to jump and actually leave the floor or use a magnet to hold metal items like paper clips in the air. The force our muscles generate over a short distance can accelerate our bodies to a point as to overcome the influence of gravity of an entire planet, at least for a short moment. And the magnetic force holding a paper clip to a magnet is strong enough to overcome the entire mass of Earth pulling it back down. Because this force is so weak, but has an immense effect that we see every single day, it was actually the first fundamental force to be discovered and yet the last to be solved. This doesn't mean, however, that gravity doesn't have its own elementary particle, just simply that we haven't discovered it yet, and there are theories in which it does exist, there are also theories that it doesn't exist, and ultimately whatever theory emerges as the accurate and true one is yet to be seen. The elementary particle of gravity is known as a graviton and would be the force carrying particle of gravity. Much like the photon it would be massless and thus travel at the speed of light in a vacuum, but unlike light that can be easily detected, the graviton interacts so weakly with other particles that it's extraordinarily difficult to even detect. 
Facilities like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN have been performing research in effort to try to find new subatomic and quantum particles to add to our knowledge and understanding of the universe, and it has, but not to the point of allowing us to quantize gravity and thus finally have a complete model of the universe in a unified field theory, otherwise known as the theory of everything. The Higgs boson, for example, was discovered at CERN and was found to give particles their mass, however it didn't carry the force of gravity. Assigning mass to particles and mediating or carrying the force of gravity are two very different things. There was a proposed supercollider in early phase building in the US that would have dwarfed the LHC at CERN and potentially have the energy levels required to detect the graviton, but its funding was pulled and the project stalled before its completion. The LHC has since been upgraded and has been operating this year with the highest energy levels it's ever been operating at, but again this doesn't guarantee the detection of the graviton. So why did we need to talk about all of this? Well, the graviton is seemingly the key to explaining how not only repulsor engines on ships in Halo work, but also how artificial gravity aboard human and Covenant ships is also possible. Or it's at least the most logical way in which it could work. When humanity discovered the gluon, we suddenly understood the strong nuclear force and immediately understood how the fundamental building blocks of the universe function. From this, we learned to use this interaction to our advantage and developed nuclear fission power and the holy grail of clean renewable energy, nuclear fusion power. While we have yet to generate more energy than is needed to sustain a nuclear fusion reaction, nuclear fusion, when it does break even, will revolutionise our society. When humanity discovered the W and Z bosons for the weak nuclear force, we understood nuclear decay, which aided our understanding of nuclear physics and allowed us to not only immensely increase the efficiency of nuclear reactors, but also be able to carbon date archaeological finds and gain a greater understanding of the history of the universe. When humanity discovered the photon, we developed machines that could harness electromagnetism and mechanics to generate usable electricity, which is ultimately the very backbone of our modern civilization, upon which literally everything we take for granted in our modern lives is based upon. We even learned to convert electricity into photons. We developed radio waves enabling us to communicate across immense distances, even to satellites, X-rays, CT scanners, MRI machines to improve our healthcare, microwaves to cook food, communication and satellite communication. We understood the electromagnetic spectrum and have harnessed it for our own gain. Now let's assume that humanity discovers the graviton, a particle which bears many similarities to the photon. From it we could discover and understand the secrets of gravitation. Suddenly we may be able to convert electricity into gravity as easily as we can flick on a light switch and the bulb illuminate the room, and if the graviton and this new emergent theory of gravitation ends up as a spectrum, very similarly to the photon, suddenly we can generate anti-gravity. All of this leads to this final conclusion. The graviton in the Halo universe is not hypothetical, it's real. And the species of the galaxy discovered it and have been using it. This explains why massive non-aerodynamic battleships like frigates of the UNSC, the Phoenix-class colony vessels, or the UNSC Infinity can hover in the air without the need for thruster pods to keep them buoyant. This is why there is gravity aboard human and covenant ships in space, because they can generate gravity as easily as flicking on a light. In the books and deeper lore, children's games exist called Grav Ball, where you skim a ball across an anti-gravity court, and there are gravity plates used by the rebels in the Ghosts of Onyx that generate intense gravity fields that cause Mjolnir's pressure systems to malfunction, causing the Spartans of Blue Team to pass out. Despite this technology being available since before the Human Covenant War and being so synonymous that it's used by children, it may well be relatively energy hungry when used on such a massive scale as aboard UNSC ships, explaining why some ships, in the books at least, had sections of the ship that were in zero-g and others that were not. During combat scenarios, some captains may have opted to turn off gravity in non-essential areas of the ship to divert that additional power to weapons and thrust systems. So now we go full circle back to repulsors. The repulsor engines are said to use stacked tidal gravity generators which create asymmetrical gravity fields that push and pull a ship through space in the desired vector, all without the need for reaction mass or conventional exhaust. This means that the actual engines generate extremely powerful artificial gravity fields or graphitic tidal force that the ship is effectively pulled towards, falls into or is pushed along by. 
The method by which the repulsor engines can do this is by generation of the graviton particle field via conversion from electricity provided by the ship's reactor. This graviton field is produced asymmetrically generating a tidal gravitational effect, being basically a gravity field with a gradient or a difference in strength. This causes the ship's centre of mass to move towards the gravity field. The gravity field then attracts the mass of the ship, causing the ship to be moved towards that centre of gravity, but since the field is being produced by the now moving ship, the field moves as well, causing the ship to continue to fall towards it. In order to steer the ship, for example moving to port, the gravitic field is moved to the left of the ship's centre of mass, causing the ship to begin turning. In order to slow down, the field is moved to behind the ship's centre of mass, causing the ship to begin slowing to a standstill, then, if hovering above a planet's surface, move the gravity field to the centre of mass, with the field strength sufficient to keep the mass of the ship hovering against the gravitational pull of the planet below. The rate of acceleration is varied and controlled by how strong the gravitic field is, but it is interesting to note that the relationship between acceleration and velocity in space if the ship's engines generate a consistent thrust of 1g, and the ship's engines are kept on indefinitely, the ship's theoretical maximum sublight speed is actually the speed of light, as a continuous acceleration of 1g over time will inevitably increase in velocity up to the theoretical maximum, or the speed of light. In practice, it's actually nearly impossible for this to actually happen in the normal dimensions of space-time and reach this velocity, as nothing with mass can travel at the speed of light in normal space-time, and even at velocities approaching relativistic, the ship colliding with a small meteor or even dust in space could impart immense kinetic energy upon the ship sufficient enough to critically damage it, or at the very least, deplete the energy shields entirely. On top of this, the stronger the repulsive gravitic field, the higher the acceleration, meaning the engines could produce tens, hundreds, or even thousands of g's of acceleration. But the internal gravity systems appear to be unaffected by this very powerful thrust method, likely through some exotic means of gravitic shielding or simply through attenuation, meaning the survival of the crew under immense acceleration is a non-issue. And obviously due to the quantum mechanical nature of the gravitic production, a repulsor engine produces quantum fluctuations in its wake that are extremely hazardous to personnel and nearby vessels within its range, particularly when operating at high quote-unquote thrust. And I believe that goes a good way of explaining how repulsors work in Halo. What do you think? Does it make sense? Is that our current best guess? Or do you have another idea in mind? Pop your comments below and I look forward to discussing it. Now, until next time, thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below and I look forward to what you have to say. And quick shout outs and thank yous to my patrons, Spartan10148, my devastatingly effective Metarch class at Scylla. Silver Spartan, Leon, Ram, Prophet Bear, and Irrefutable Justice, my ever vigilant monitors. The careful tending of Alvin, Andrew, Brian, Cameron, Darian, Devon, Phantom, Flaming Halo, Cabal, Legions Lost, Michael, Spartan0137, The Cave Potato, and Wolf Eclipse, my sub monitors. My growing fleet of Strato Sentinels. And my most loyal of enforcers and all my awesome sentinels, sentries, and constructors who have jumped aboard on Patreon to help support the channel. You have my debt of gratitude. And, as ever, Todd Morrison, my Tier Zero Transcentient YouTube member. Thanks for keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, as it all helps the channel grow and helps me to continue to deliver this kind of content for you guys. And if you're ready for your next steps in evolution, head over to Patreon and become a patron there or become a YouTube member to attain a higher state of being. Much love to all of you, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.